Hey, what's up, people? Welcome to my review and in-depth analysis of Timothy Zahn's Star Wars novel, Survivor's Quest. Now, I've been looking forward to reading this book for a very long time, but I always manage to just choose a different book. And now that I've finally gotten to reading this book, it is a huge disappointment. And it is easily the worst Timothy Zahn's book that I've ever read. Now, if you've seen my other review for his book, Outbound Flight, which is basically a prequel to this, and it's a prequel in general to his whole Timothy Zahn timeline, kind of, that takes place within the EU and within Star Wars. So basically, Timothy Zahn has his own little narrative within Star Wars. You have Outbound Flight, you have Allegiance, you have Choices of One, and then you have the Thrawn Trilogy, and then you have the Thr Hand of Thrawn Duology, and then it ends with this one. And there's also another book that's kind of a side story called Scoundrels, involving Lando, Chewie, and Han Solo, right? But this one is kind of the end until he restarted his own canon within the Disney timeline, right? With this whole Thrawn trilogy and things like that, or like the Thrawn origin trilogy, rather. But anyway, this book was such a massive disappointment. And if you know, if you read my other review for Outbound Flight, it's another book that I didn't like by Timothy Zahn. But you know what? This one is worse. Because even though I didn't like Outbound Flight, it was never boring. What I didn't like about Outbound, Outbound Flight was how certain characters were characterized. I really hated how Joris Seabock was in that book. I felt like it ruined his character. Long story short, in the Thrawn trilogy, there's this crazy Jedi clone named Joris Seabock, and he's gone insane because he's a clone. But in Outbound Flight, the prequel, the original Joris Seabock, he's already crazy. He's already insane, and I didn't like that. I wanted to, because for me, his clone being crazy, and then him, his actual original template, or his, his real self being crazy, it kind of ruined it. I didn't like that. And there were some other things I didn't like as well, but speaking about Survivor's Quest, this book was just a bore to read, and basically nothing happens within 80% of this book. And when things finally start to happen and when the book is finally over, I felt like that's it. This is the big hype. So the actual like synopsis for this story is basically, it sounds interesting on paper. It's basically Luke Skywalker and his wife, Mara Jade, are going to find the remnants or the remains of Outbound Flight. Immediately, I was like, oh, wow, that's an interesting story. I wonder if they're going to find out that the Jedi had a big role to play in why Outbound Flight was such a failure. Because Jorah Seaboth was a flaming asshole. If you read Outbound Flight, he is just an asshole. He's just, he is like the biggest non-Jedi ever. Like, he, I do not understand how Jorah Seaboth became a Jedi because he's like, straight up dark side he he looks down upon other uh beings he devalues other beings and he's just this big asshole and that's why i didn't like that book because for me there was no way that george seaboth could have been a jedi with his attitude anyway for this book i thought oh wow that sounds really interesting luke and mara they're gonna discover what happened and the role the jedi played and i wonder what the ramifications are gonna be to that and how luke is going to contemplate on that discovery man there's absolutely nothing like that in this book nothing whatsoever in fact when our characters our protagonists go and find the remains of outbound flight there's people there survivors from the original disaster and they don't like jedi they look at jedi as evil Right, And I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. We're going to find out why they look at Jedi as evil uh, beings. Man, we never even find out anything about that. The, the, 
Luke and Mara, they don't even find out nothing about that. There is absolutely no diving into the subject matter whatsoever. It's just Luke and Mara go there. The people, the survivors there, some of them quarantine force sensitive beings because they view them as evil. And basically they blame the Jedi for the disaster that happened or as playing a, a major part in it. And it's like, oh, okay, we're not going to figure out what happened. We're not going to dive into that subject matter whatsoever. Wow, man, what a huge wasted opportunity to dive into this and to see Luke especially deal with this. The ramifications, the discovery of learning that the Jedi were responsible for this major failure, this project known as Outbound Flight, which was basically um, the Republic was sending colonists and some and a handful of Jedi into the unknown regions to explore. And man, that was just such a wasted opportunity. But even with all that aside, so let's say the story went in, diff went in a different direction. Okay, the story didn't go the way I wanted it to go. Nevertheless, man, this thing was so boring. Nothing happened. It was like Timothy Zahn had all these opportunities to create suspense and mystery because there's like this sabotaging that's happening on the ship on the way to the remains of outbound flight. And it's just like there's no suspense in the sabotaging. It's like, oh, there's a fire in the mess hall. Oh, it was an accident. Oh, there's this this thing happened over here. There was another electrical fire and some mysterious thing. Oh, no, it was nothing. And it, it's just, I just feel like this book was just poorly written and easily Timothy Zahn's worst book. And there is a huge difference in writing style between the Bantam era Timothy Zahn and the Del Rey era of Timothy Zahn. If you see, because I just read the Hand of Thrawn duology before reading this, and I'm like, it feels like a completely different person that's writing. I mean, it's nowhere near as detailed, the writing, and it's just, it's, it just feels very glossed over, and it feels like, almost like he phoned it in, and you feel like he restrained himself, and was like, ah, oh, whatever, I'm not going to put too much effort into this. Even the vocabulary, it just feels, it feels almost like a junior novel, when compared to the Thrawn trilogy and the Hand of Thrawn duology. And in short, man, I hated this book. I really wanted to throw this book across the room because I got to like page 275 and I think the book is 360 pages and nothing happened. It was just literally nothing happened. I feel, I feel like maybe you could have started on page 265, maybe provide a brief paragraph about what's happened up to this point and boom, there you go. So... At the end of the day, the big deal that this book decides to focus on is this alien race known as the Vagari, right? And basically, the disaster that was outbound flight, the reason why it was a, was a disaster, not only were the, did the Jedi play a part in that because Jorah Seaboth was a flaming asshole and an idiot, and basically he kind of... Uh, well, he most definitely exemplified terrible leadership. But not only that, but the Chiss were involved, and that involves the Chiss Ascendancy and Thrawn, because Thrawn was kind of against his uh, the Chiss Ascendancy, and this is kind of why Thrawn ended up going to the Empire, because the Chiss Ascendancy basically kicked Thrawn out of their, uh, out of their Empire, right? I mean, out of the Ascendancy. They, they, they kicked them out out of their ranks, right? So Thrawn decides to go and join the Empire, right? And not only that, but the Vagari were involved. So basically, you have the Vagari versus the Chiss. Thrawn takes, uh, he, decides, he decides to be proactive, right? And that's a big no-no with the Chiss. The Chiss believe that they should never attack unless they are provoked. Well, Thrawn decided to attack first because he felt like they were a threat. And... Basically, the Vagari want revenge, right? So that turns out to be the big, big, big twist in this book. 
This is why I wasted four weeks in reading this worthless piece of crap to find out that the Vagari want revenge. And I was like, really? Like, really? That's the big twist? Like, there is nothing more insignificant to me in all the reading that I've done than the Vagari, right? And as soon as I find out that the Vagari are like the big villains, right? I'm like, okay, let me guess. Mara and Luke rescued and saved the day. And I mean, and that's what happens. As soon as you find out that the Vagari are behind everything and that they want revenge, the book becomes worthless to me. All that patience, all that reading, all that boredom that I endured just to get to this because I, I stuck with the book, man, because I like Timothy Zahn, right? And I felt like, no, stick with the book. Something is going to happen. Something's going to happen. And when that big twist happened that the Vagari are behind everything and that they ba they basically want to steal a dreadnought from the outbound flight because outbound flight, I think there's like five or six dreadnoughts attached around it. So you have a core and then around the core are a bunch of dreadnoughts. So the Vagari, they want the dreadnought so they can take out revenge on everybody that did them dirty and outbound flight, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it was just boring, man. The Vagari are not interesting villains. They suck. They're boring. They feel generic. And man, yeah, I can't recommend this book at all. But anyway, I'm going to begin this review and in-depth analysis of this worthless piece of crap known as Survivor's Quest. Now, the novel opens up with this meeting between Talon Card and Luke and Mara Jade, right? And basically, Talon Card, he's trying to go straight, man. Talon Card, he wants to be legit, and Mara and Luke negotiate his exit out of, you know, his seedy smuggling business with this character named Huxley, right? Now, there's a message that is being sent to Luke. So someone has a message for Luke from a character named Park on, uh, on the planet Naruian. Right, I'm terrible with Star Wars names, so bear with me. And basically, this message was stolen by a character named Dean Gensler, right? And this character named Dean Gensler, he's going to be an important character in this book, and he basically is a huge connection between this book and Outbound Flight because he connects with an important character from that. So again... Card's people picked up an urgent transmission addressed to Luke, which came from Park on the planet Neruian. Now, if you remember, the planet Neruian, that's where uh, the Hand of Thrawn duology took place. That's where the, um, the headquarters of the Empire of the Hand, and that's where the, the Hand of Thrawn was, right? Now, when I got done reading the Hand of Thrawn duology, I did feel a little like, uh, you know, they kind of left it really open-ended as to what this Empire of the Hand are going to be doing. Like, they just, Luke and Mara just kind of left them chilling in the outskirts of out, out, uh, of the unknown regions. And I kind of felt like, well, well, well are we going to resolve that? Well, this book doesn't resolve anything either. <laughs> so that, that was a little bit of a disappointment as well. So anyway, back to the message that was sent to Luke from Park. Now, the message is stolen by a member of Card's own organization, a character named Dean Gensler, right? And Dean Gensler turns out to be posing as an ambassador for the New Republic. So while that's going down, Mara and Luke, they go to Park on the planet Neruian, and he tells Mara and Luke that the Chiss have found the remains of outbound flight. And then Mara and Luke go to a planet called Krusty in order to meet with the Chiss. Now, again, Dean Gensler is posing as a Republic ambassador, and he feels this sense of urgency to see outbound flight. He needs to see the remains of outbound flight, and he's willing to go to great lengths in order to accompany the voyage there because he needs to see the remains. Now, the Chiss tell Mara and Luke of the battle that took place between Thrawn, the Vagari, 
and outbound flight, right? So it was like a three-way battle and all that. And those enslaved by the Vagari also want to see the remains of outbound flight too. And these aliens are known as the Garoons or Jeroons, whatever, right? So the Garoons, they come across as like this peaceful alien species that want to pay great respects to outbound flight and everybody that was involved in basically destroying the Vagari. And later, Mara J discovers Chakfell and stormtroopers from the Empire of the Hand, and they're present on the voyage to the remains of outbound flight. And an interesting thing to note is that Chakfell, he's the son of Baron Sutan Fell. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, Mara investigates a cut cable that almost killed Luke Skywalker. So initially when Luke and Mara went on the ship in order to voyage to the remains of outbound flight, there was this accident where this, I guess you want to say this cut cable and this beam swang down and almost hurt Luke and Mara Jade goes to investigate because initially it was supposed to be an accident and she finds out through her through her detective skills that it wasn't an accident. And let me just tell you that this thing was not exciting at all. Like when when this beam almost hurt Luke. Oh my God, is Luke gonna get killed because of this falling beam? Is this the end of Luke? I mean, it was so stupid and boring. I just felt like, really? And then like, oh, Mara, I'm gonna go investigate to see if that cut cable was really an accident. And it's like, here, let me guess, it wasn't. I mean, it's like, this is the thing I was talking about in my introduction. It's like, Timothy Zahn, he's trying to, if I feel like he's trying to create mystery and suspense and, and having our protagonist do detective work, but the mystery's boring. It's like, I could have told you as soon as that beam swang at Luke that it was a setup, right? And for a good mystery and to generate suspense, you have to make the reader feel like, you know, invested, not know right away, like, dude, someone tried to kill Luke, right? I mean, or or something like that. I mean, it's just, it, it just felt like such a dull and cliche little device within the plot. Like, like, oh, was it an accident? Let me go and investigate. And it's like, as soon as you know that beam almost hit Luke, you knew it wasn't an accident because you can see where Timothy Zahn's writing is coming from a mile away. Anyway, so Mara finds out it wasn't an accident and Fell and his fellow stormtroopers are ordered by Park to look after Luke and Mara, right? And initially Luke and Mara were kind of like stormtroopers. I don't know. I don't like, we don't really, you know, have the most positive feelings in regards to stormtroopers. But you have to remember that this novel takes place after the Hand of Thrawn duology. Therefore, the Empire and the New Republic have made peace. There's no more drama. There's no more war between them. The war is over. So Mara just feels kind of weird because she used to work for the Empire. And Luke feels a little taken, taken aback because, you know, of all his years fighting against the Empire and things like that. So a fire breaks out mysteriously on the ship as they voyage to the remains of outbound flight. And troopers, the stormtroopers, and Mara and Luke help put out the fire. And it's like, oh, was it sabotage? And then the uh, you know, the crew and personnel are are very, very uh insistent that it wasn't. It was an accident. And it's like, dude. As soon, as soon as you find out there's a fire, you're like, it's not an accident. And again, this is where I feel like the writing fails. It's not suspenseful at all. There's no mystery at all. Even though Timothy Zahn is trying really hard to make it a mystery, who started the fire? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's just like, oh my God. Was it, was it started on purpose? Was it? Gee, I don't know. Ugh. Anyway... So the outbound flight operation manual is also stolen from Fell's headquarters. 
Oh, is it? What, is somebody up to something? I don't know. So first the beam tried to attack Luke. Then there was a fire. Now Fell's manual for outbound flight is stolen. Is it? Is is is, is, is there somebody up to no good? I don't know. I don't. I better read on, <laughs> dude. This thing is boring as hell. None of this stuff was interesting. None of it was suspenseful. You knew somebody was up to no good. And I knew 100% that it was not the Stormtroopers or Fell. Because that would have been too obvious, right? <sighs> so anyways, it turns out that Ambassador Dean Jensler is actually the brother of a Jedi that was on outbound flight. And he tells Luke and Mara because they, in, they see through his lies. They know he's lying. They know he's being dishonest. And Jensler tells Luke and Mara that George Cardass told him to intercept Luke's message. So George Cardass, he's this big information broker, and he has a connection to all this Thrawn storyline, right? He had a major role in the Hand of Thrawn duology. He had a major role in Outbound Flight. Where, well, here he just kind of takes like a small off the page role. And anyway, he provided Dean Gensler the information and he hooked them up with this information. And Cardass spoke to Chiss, he's like the big leader, and his name is Aristocra Fromby. So, he informed this guy that Ambassador Dean Gensler was going to attend the voyage to the remains of outbound flight. So Dean Gensler's sister was on outbound flight, and her character is named Lorna. Now, Lorna, she was a very good Jedi. Like, she had a good heart. She was nothing like Jor Seaboth, who was this flaming asshole and lunatic that basically was straight dark sider. Lorna, I believe though she was a lot younger than George Seaboth, if my memory serves me correctly. And she, you know, she had a good heart. And while George Seaboth was doing all this questionable uh evil stuff and looking down upon uh crew members, so George Seaboth's big thing was to look down upon beings who weren't Jedi. He was walking around acting like the Jedi were superior to everybody, right? And everybody was just subspecies. Everybody should get on their knees and kiss the Jedi's ass. Well, Lorna, she really didn't like that. And she sent something wrong the entire time with that attitude that George Seaboth had. And we're going to find out later in the novel as to why specifically Gensler wants to find out what happened to her, right? So here he doesn't reveal all this information. This is just me recapping my memory of Outbound Flight. So after he reveals who he really is to Luke and Mara and that he's not an ambassador, he kind of just leaves it at that. He doesn't go into this explicit details as to why he's going there and things of that nature. But we will get to that later. He does he does reveal that. And I will say that Dean Gensler's sentiments are probably the best thing about this book, right? Because it actually, you know, it actually had some 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 depth. It actually had some uh, uh, interesting characterization going on within him. In fact, he's the most interesting character in this book. Even more interesting than Luke and Mara. Because Luke and Mara, I feel like they learn nothing. They phone in they phone in all their actions. I mean, and and for a lot of time in this novel, I felt like they were off the page, right? And we'll get into that later. So later everybody gets stuck in like a, a elevator and and all the parties are separated, right? And it just felt like that dragged on for too long. These characters being separated and nothing suspenseful happened. And it was boring. But anyway, Gensler is caught in a restricted area 
he says that he wandered off and he reveals that he's the brother of a Jedi from outbound flight. But again, he's being secreted. So when Jinsler, wa Jinsler wanders off, everybody is on high alert and everybody's alarmed that he got caught in this restricted area because of all these things happening, the stolen outbound flight manual, the fire, the falling beam. And again, it's not suspenseful. I, don't, I know Jinsler is not behind it. But anyway, Luke and Mara sense survivors. And outbound flight. So, upon all this introduction and all this voyage to the remains of outbound flight, it wasn't divulged to anybody that there were survivors. So, nobody in the book up to this point were like, oh yeah, and we found survivors. So, when they actually start approaching the remains of outbound flight, Luke and Mara sense that there are survivors on board. And this piqued my interest. This became intriguing. This did become interesting. Right? Oh, they're survivors. Oh, okay. This is this is interesting. But all the way up to this point, it's just been a bore. Again, nothing suspenseful, nothing mysterious at all. So as our protagonists decide to deploy themselves and investigate outbound flight, they find themselves trapped in carts and elevators and anyway. So the protagonists, they are confined. And this automatically signals to them that they're dealing with survivors who are very untrusting. Now, Ambassador, quote-unquote, Jinsler, he is chosen to explain why they are here to Pressor the Guardian. So this individual named Pressor the Guardian, he's like the big leader of the survivors of Outbound Flight. Now, Jinsler tells Pressor that they're there in order to help survivors, if needed. But Aristocra Formby says that they must leave because they are in Chiss restricted territory. So you have these conflicting messages being sent to the survivors, namely Pressor the Guardian. So Jinsler is telling them, hey, we're here to help you if you guys need help. But then the Chiss, they're like, we need you to leave. You're in restricted Chiss territory and we're going to help you leave. So this conflicting messages, it doesn't look good to this Pressor the Guardian individuals. Now, everyone but the Jedi and the Stormtroopers are taken to this individual named Director Uliar. So Director Uliar, he's another one of the main leaders of the survivors of Outbound Flight. Now, Uliar knows that Jinsler is related to Lorna, one of the Jedi who were originally on outbound flight. And Jinsler says that he hated her. So there is a nice little interesting exchange between these two characters. And again, Jinsler, he's the most interesting thing in this book, right? And that and that's very telling because you would think that the most interesting thing in this book would be Luke, Mara, but no, it's this Jinsler character. And the exchange goes like this. So this Uliar character, he, he's untrustworthy. He doesn't really like these people coming to his colony, whether they're survivors of outbound flight or not. This is their home, right? Outbound flight is their home. He doesn't like these unknown people. He doesn't trust them. And he has this deep-seated hatred for the Jedi. It hasn't been 100% fully revealed, but... You can tell that he doesn't like Jedi, right? And when he finds out that Jinsler is related to Lorna because of the last name or something like that, he, you know, he immediately kind of concludes that, oh, you must revere the Jedi. You know, he must be one of those ass kissers that revere the Jedi. And then uh, Ambassador Jinsler, he's like, nah, actually, I hated my sister. And kind of leaves it at that. And it's kind of an eyebrow raising moment. Right? And it's intriguing because you want to know why. Now if you've read Outbound Flight. You kind of know why already. It's kind of touched upon there. But not so, not yet within the novel. So that was interesting. Now Luke and Mara. 
they kind of, and the stormtroopers, they, they each try to escape their confinement, right? And they're successful. And this is where the book gets boring again. Because you have uh, uh, Ambassador Jinsler over here trying to negotiate, trying to talk to Director Ulier and convince him that they're not bad guys. Then you got Fell and the Stormtroopers over here trying to escape. Then you got Luke and Mara over here in their little confinement trying to escape. And we spend a lot of time away from Luke and Mara. And when we go back to them, oh, they're still trying to escape. Oh, they're still wandering um, shafts and trying to find a way out. And, and it, it's just it's just boring, man. It's boring. The Luke and Mara Jade aspects of this book are boring. And we get a little bit of action from them at the very end. But for the most part, it just bored the hell out of me. But anyway... Luke and Mara, they escape their confinement and they find a prison, right? And this prison is specifically designated to quarantine individuals. And there's a little bit of intrigue here because you don't know if this quarantine is alluding to some kind of outbreak of disease or something like that. But ultimately, what is being quarantined is for sensitive individuals, right? And, oh, I was like, okay, this is interesting. This is a little interesting. Are Luke and Mara going to find out why the leaders of the outbound flight community hate force sensitive beings? Why they hate Jedi? No, we don't. We don't find out. So all this intrigue is for nothing because it goes absolutely nowhere. Now, Fell and the Stormtroopers, they find children with the force, so basically force-sensitive children in quarantine, and Uliar considers these children to be evil, right? Again, this was one of the few aspects of the book that was interesting, but it went absolutely nowhere because Luke, Mara, none of them find out why the Jedi are considered evil, right? Now, Mara and Luke... They discover that the Jeroons are frauds and that they are the ones that attacked the vessel that they were taking in order to get to outbound flight. So they find out that the Jeroons were the ones responsible for that fire and all the suspicious stuff that was going on. And the Jeroons attack the Chiss for revenge. So this is their whole thing. The Garoons want to take out the Chiss for revenge for the events that took place in the book Outbound Flight, right? So that means what? That the Jeroons are actually the Vagari. So this whole time, the Vagari have been posing as the slaves of the Vagari, of them. They were posing as the Garoons, but they weren't really Garoons or Jeroons, whatever the hell. They were actually Vagari. And it was all just a, a, a lie and a, a deception in order to get them close to this dreadnought because that's what they want. They want to take one of the dreadnoughts from outbound flight. They want to make sure the Chiss suffer. They want to make sure everybody that was involved in their defeat suffer. So that's what they care about. They care about revenge. And there's this little girl that's present named Evelyn. And she's this Force-sensitive child, and she helps Jensler and the others. And there was another little interesting thing here. She doesn't want to show her Force-sensitive powers. She doesn't want to be a Jedi. She doesn't want to train. She doesn't want anything to do with the Force because of how Uliar and the community treat Force-sensitive individuals. They quarantine them. They consider them evil, so she's trying to hide that stuff. She doesn't want to show her Force-sensitive powers because of the ramifications of what will happen if she, they find out she is a, a Force-sensitive child. So I thought that was interesting, and that goes nowhere, too. Now, Uliar wants to quarantine Evelyn, and it's at this point in the story where we get 
more details in regards to what's going on with Jinsler and his whole sentiments that he has for his sister. Like, why is he ultimately there? And in the Outbound Flight book, and kind of it's recollected in this book as well. So Jensler hated his sister. He hated his sister because of how revered she was within his family, namely his parents. His mother and father loved his sister, and he was jealous. And he felt that his parents, they put her on this pedestal. They put his sister on this pedestal, and he felt like he could never live up to the expectation, or not the expectation, but he just couldn't live up to the reputation that she had, the reverence. And he felt like his parents always looked down upon him because he wasn't Force-sensitive, because he didn't get to be a Jedi. So he hated her. He hated her and everything she would stood for, and it was all rooted in jealousy. But ultimately, now, in this book, Survivor's Quest, he realizes that he actually hates himself, not his sister. And it was a nice little uh, revelation for the most interesting character in this book. However, if we take a step back and look at the grand, the bigger picture of the Star Wars saga, the expanded universe, all this stuff is meaningless. It's like, yeah, this is interesting for the book, but at the end of the day, it's one big, who cares? That's what this entire book is. It's who cares? Who gives a shit? So anyway, Luke and Mara help, and Mara actually finally does, or just Mara and Luke in general, finally exemplify some badass Jedi skill. So the Vagari, they have these animals that they were using as cloaks, but they were, I guess you want to say these animals, they were playing dead, but they were actually alive. And when it was time for the Vagari to strike, the animals came alive and they're called wolf kills or something like that. And anyway, they're these feral creatures and they start attacking and Mara Jade has a badass scene where she just takes them out. It was awesome and it was well, it was very welcome uh, from me to finally get some action in this book because the book has just been boring as hell. Now... The Jedi and the 501st team up, the 501st that's fell in the Stormtroopers, they team up in order to fight against the Vagari. And ultimately, that little girl, Evelyn, she, she joins Luke and Mara and helps out using her Jedi skills, or her Force skills, rather. And it was nice. That was a nice little cute little moment. And the Vagari blow up this pylon. And the reason why they do that is because they're, they they get this dreadnought. So I guess you want to say they dislodge this dreadnought and they're able to steal this dreadnought from outbound flight. And ultimately their goal is to use the dreadnought against all their enemies and all this stuff. And uh, it's at this point that the reader's like, oh, will the Jedi stop them? Oh my God, I'm so scared of the Vagari. <laughs> Not. Anyway... Uh, Aristocra Formby, or whatever the hell his name is, the, the leader of the Chiss, he lets everybody know that he knew the entire time that the Jeroons were actually the Vagari. And the reason why he did this was because he wanted the Vagari to attack first. Why? Because what did I say in the introduction? The Chiss do not attack unless they are provoked. So he purposely allowed the Vagari to pose as the Jeroons because he knew that they would attack. And now that they have attacked, he has every reason to just wipe them out. So that was a little bit of deception from the Chiss. Now, it's also discovered that there's line creepers all over the place sabotaging everything and creating these technical difficulties for our protagonists. Now, Luke and Mara go after the Vagari, right, who have taken off in the Dreadnought. So there's this 
Now, Luke and Mara, they they land on the Vagari Dreadnought, whatever, the ship that's been taken over by the Vagari. And there was this interesting thing where they they uh they get there by coming across this Clone Wars era ship. I think it was actually one of the the uh the ships that the Jedi use. And um I guess that was kind of sort of interesting. And anyway, once Luke and Mara get on that dreadnought, they have this long fight with droidicas, you know, the the uh, droids, the ball droids with the force field from the prequel era, right? And I thought that was boring as hell. I didn't really find that exciting. So, th so I just want you to know that this part of the novel, this is the peak of the novel. This is it. This is the climax. And to me, this was just boring as hell, man. Like, this is like a scene that, a little dinky scene that you could see in the Clone Wars, man. Like, it's nothing. So, they have this long fight with the Droidicas. Let me guess. Luke and Mara are able to defeat the Droidicas. No suspense whatsoever. And the Vagari leader, at this point, releases this poison into the air. And Mara decides to basically create this breach in the bridge on the bridge and what this does is sucks all the air and poison into the vacuum of space and what ultimately ends up happening is that it kills the vagari at the same time so they're all dead due to mara's maneuver right here and mara and luke are able to survive because they use their jedi uh training and things like this and the chiss also show up to the rescue to to, to get rid of uh any attacking ships that are deployed by the Vagari. And that's basically the climax. So ultimately what happens in regards to the survivors, they are given a choice of whether they want to stay here with the remains of outbound flight in their little colony, or do they want to go to the Empire of the Hand or the New Republic? And, and in regards to the Chiss, they use this Vagari transmission that was basically sent from when they stole the Dreadnought. And they use this transmission in order to locate, I guess, their home planet. So they just plan to go and attack the Vagari. And what's the outcome of this? We don't know because it ends open-ended. Do I give a shit? No, I don't. I could care less about the Vagari. And I could care less about the Chiss and their mission to fight the Vagari. It's like, who cares? I don't care. And then there's this other stupid thing that takes place at the end of the novel. It's very brief, but Luke and Mara contemplate whether there's this other, whether there's another clone of Thrawn. And they're like, yes, no, maybe so. And at this point, it just upsets me because that would have been infinitely more interesting than what was given to me in this boring, dumb book. But it's just in there for good measure, just to piss you off. And, you know, and also another thing upsets me. And this is what really upset me. This is what sealed the deal for me. This book is an F. It was this, is that. They come across like recordings or something or like there's like the it's alluded that there are records that can possibly reveal what happened to the Jedi during outbound flight. And it says that, oh, it, it would take a long time to salvage the records as to what happened with the Jedi and outbound flight. And I'm like, thanks, man. Thanks a lot. Because to me, that was the most interesting uh, prospect of this book of Luke and Mara going to the remains of Outbound Flight. And Timothy Zahn just leaves it there like, oh, it would take a long time to find the record. So we got to move on. Luke and Mara never find out what happened. And that's the end of the book. I give this book an F. It's awful. Don't waste your time. In fact, I'm done with this review because I got better things to do than waste any more time on this worthless piece of crap. Thank you for listening. 
May the force be with you. And last but not least, people, one love.